Okay, guys, um, did everybody get the uh, integration project part two handout? If you didn't, you can log on to Blackboard. When you get into Blackboard, go to the assignment folder. Inside the assignment folder, there should be a link called IC integration part B. Just go ahead and click on the integration part B.zip. Or it just automatically downloads. In this case, I'm using Firefox, so when I click on the integration part B.zip, it's asking me to do one of two things. I'm going to put a dot next to save the file. The reason why I choose to save the file is so that if I want to rehearse this, I can do it. Secondly, is I know where it's at, so I can extract the contents of the file by clicking Show All Downloads. Right click on the integration part B and choose Open Containing Folder. As you can see, it downloaded in the administrator folder called Downloads. If I right click on the integration part B folder, come down here to extract all, and then I'm just going to click extract. Remember, Legos are only fun when you open up the box and spill them all over the place. With your final hands-on part, you might be getting a source file like this that might be compressed, and you will have to log on to Blackboard to download the contents. Once you download it, remember to extract it. So, simply Go to the location, right click on it, hit extract all. Okay, did everybody get that? You all have the same files? Good. All right, and according to the first one, uh, the first step on your instruction sheet that I gave you guys, they're asking you to open up the welcome memo. Let's do that. Now, Office recognizes that you've downloaded this file via the internet. And some files you download off the internet aren't things that you can probably trust. They're asking you, do you trust this? If so, click Enable Editing. Let's do that. And before I change anything with this file, I'm going to do a Save As. So I'm going to go up to the File button, choose Save As, and then I'm going to replace the IOU, <laughs> I don't IOU anything, uh, I01B with my last name, underscore, followed by my first name. What file extension does Microsoft Office, or sorry, Word 2013 give, or even 10, my apologies, 2010, give their files? Word file. So what does a Word file end with? Dot .doc, that was the old one. What's the new one? X, right? So let's click Save. All right. Remember, this is a two-part integration. We did the first part on Tuesday. That was embedding. Today we're going to do the second part, linking. So we've been le learning about OLE, which we call Object Linking and Embedding. So on Tuesday, I showed you guys as a way to review to get you ready for the final, I showed you guys how to insert the file name of this document down in the footer. Can anybody tell me how to do that? Okay, so insert, then footer. This gives us a sort of like custom style, but I can do it right from here by clicking on edit footer. Let's do that. And what that'll do is it'll drop me right down to the bottom of the page. Another way of doing that is simply scroll down to the bottom of the page and double click on that region, correct? Okay, now you're in the footer. What do I, what can I do to insert the file name? Now in 2013 they made this easier. You go up to the design tab and then you had something called document info. That's not there. Instead, we have these quick parts. So when we click on this quick part, what am I going to choose now? I wish it was there. It's not. We have to pick Jessica. Field. Yes. In 2013, it is there. And it's a lot easier. However, we need to make that transition. So let's scroll down here until we get to the Fs. Eventually, you will see 
file name, click on it once, and then click OK. Why didn't I just type out the file name? What's the difference of using fields versus just hard coding a value into a document? Because you can do this with dates, you can do this with page numbers. In fact, on your hands-on, you will have to do this with page numbers. So in a minute, I'll ask you guys to show me how to do it with page numbers. What's the big benefit about using fields over static text? Yep. And what most corporations do is they ask you not only to put the file name in there, but the location. And the reason why that's important is because when you go to these meetings, somebody might ask, hey, is there anybody get a copy of that? And you can simply say, well, down at the bottom of the document is the location for that. And it's going to be on some network server because it's going to be a shared resource. And that's simple. Just once again, go up to the Design tab, go over here to Quick Parts, choose Fields, and then I'll have File Location. Could you combine the two? Sure. File Location followed by File Name. Now from here, how can I insert just the page number over on the right side? Yeah, I want to insert the page number over on the right side. If you hit the tab key twice, one will take you to the center, and then the second one will take you to the right edge of the page. Because we have these things called tab stops. I don't have my ruler up here, but if I wanted to, I can come over here to the far right above my scroll bar, click it once, and now I have my ruler. You see I have these goofy little shapes up here? These are called your tab stops. So when I hit the tab key once, it took me to the center tab stop. When I clicked it again or hit it again, it took me to the second tab stop. All right, so now I'm in the right location. Megan, how do I do the page number? Click on that triangle next to page number. I'm in the right position now, right? So I'm just going to go to current position. And let's just do the plain number itself, the very first one that'll do. It. All right, if you folks are just coming in, sign on the Blackboard, download this. Uh, somewhere on your desk, I left in some instructions for you. We are at uh, step number two, if I remember correctly. We're just getting to step number two. Now, what's the benefit, once again, of doing that instead of just typing in a number one? Yeah, exactly. So from here on out, it'll be scalable. The other nice thing about using fields is that you guys can create an automatic table of contents for you. By using fields and headings, you can hit a button that says Create Content Page, and then it'll list them followed by their page number. And as your pages change, that page will be updated as well. Remember, we want to be scalable, flexible. All right, let's close out of this. This is going to be our report. This is the memo that we're going to be sending to everybody, and it's going to contain several links. One of the links is going to be the products that we offer and how much they're worth or cost. The other thing is going to be is a list of stores and their locations. And then we're going to send this out to people. We're going to send it out to about five people, but we're not going to type in their names. By the end of class today, we're going to be able to do what we call a mail merge. We're going to go to a query. We're going to grab their names. And then we're just going to print out one record out of the four. And you'll see how the names change each time we print out the records. OK? So let's begin this. Let's go back down to our folder. By the way, remember we should save often when we're doing this integration stuff because it's prone to crashing. Why is integration stuff prone to crashing? Especially when you're embedding. Exactly. You're going to fill up your memory. So I'm going to hold the control key and hit what letter on my keyboard to save. There we go. All right, now that I saved, I'm going to go back down here to my folder, click on integration part B. And then I'm going to open up my Excel inventory file. So now we're on step two, if you guys are following along. Let me grab my Excel window over here. You might have to click that Enable Edit button because, once again, we've downloaded this file from the Internet. 
And as a review, why don't you guys add a footer to this worksheet? Now remember, worksheets are supposed to go on and on and on forever. But your printers do not print pages that go on and on forever. So what do I do? What view do I change so I can get the header footer on my worksheet? Page layout. So down here near the bottom where my clock is, I'm going to click on the second icon in, the one in the middle. If you hover over it, it should say page layout. Now I'm going to zoom out a little bit so you guys get to see what's going on here. I have the header up top, and so the footer will be down at the bottom. Now remember, when you're in Excel and you hit the tab key, it goes from cell to cell to cell. So there is no tab stops in Excel. This is why the footer, or the header, is broken off into three parts. So we're going to click on the lower left corner. So I'm in the left section of my header. And how am I going to add the file name to this? Up top in the design tab. It seems like this is a lot easier than Word. Go figure. But up here, you have your elements. Click on file name. Now, just to spice it up on the exam, I might not ask you guys to add the file name. But I might ask you guys to add like the workbook or the worksheet name. And as you can see, go to the design tab. One of those elements might be there. Okay, page number. I want it in the right corner of the footer. How would I do it? Okay. Yeah, I know, folks. It seems pretty obvious, right? So I click there once. Then where do I go, Adam? After you click on that, hit the space bar on your keyboard, type in of, then hit the space bar after that, and then now click on number of pages. Do you notice I'm just seeing these goofy looking characters, then of, then another goofy bunch of characters? Click back on the worksheet. And now does it say one of one? And if we had two pages, and if you're on the first page, it'll say one of two, right? OK. Let's save this. So let's do a file save as. Once again, remove the I01B from the file name. Type in your last name, followed by your first name. And then click Save. I'm going to go back to worksheet view, so I'm going to click on the first view button. All right. Josh, how do I show the clipboard pane on the side of my document? Remember on Tuesday we were copying multiple items? Okay, so you go to the Home tab. Remember we did a lot of things from the Home tab? Yeah, and then you click on the little launcher right here near the upper left corner. There we go. You guys notice now it says one of 24 items. So the clipboard can handle 24 total items, and I should specify the office clipboard. The little launcher, the little icon next to clipboard. Oh, uh, that might just be a resolution for your screen. So if your screen's so comp compacted, it might just read just the symbols or copy paste. Oh, because you might have nothing on the clipboard. It's clipboard's right. empty. So what Adam was telling me is that his paste is grayed out, and the reason why that is is his clipboard's empty. Mine is not. I have something that I copied off of the internet. Uh, okay. And if I want to delete that, I can just click clear all. And when I do that, you'll see that my paste button does go to the gray because there's nothing to paste because my, my clipboard's empty. All right, now the Office clipboard and the Windows clipboard's a little goofy. They do share the same space. So if you copy something off the internet and you want to paste it in here, it will show up on this clipboard. However, the Windows clipboard only allows you guys to copy one thing at a time. The office clipboard, 24 items. So how do I select items to the last price? So sell A3 to B22. Click 
Click and hold, so click on A3 and hold and go all the way down to B22. I'm going to hold the control key and hit what letter? C. And when I do that, that should come over here. All right, so on Tuesday's class, we did copy something from Excel and brought it into Word, but we just simply paste it and we call that embedding. The advantages of embedding something is that you don't need the original file, correct? One of the disadvantages of embedding something is that that file size becomes a lot larger. It doesn't update automatically. So what we're going to do is we're going to link this part to a section in our Word memo. Then we're going to come back, we're going to make a few changes to the prices. And we're going to go back to the memo. So there's going to be a lot of back and forward stuff. So to make this simple, after we copy this, we're going to close out of it and we're going to open back up. So this way we only see one document at a time. I'm also being very cautious because, once again, when you have many files open, it slows down your computer and it could cause it to crash, right? So it is copied. I'm going to close out of that. If it asks you to save, go ahead and click yes. I'm going to go back to my Word memo. You see I had this first paragraph and the second paragraph? Click somewhere in between the first and second paragraph. You notice over here on my clipboard, I have those items selected. Is that right? Now I'm going to go up to the clipboard region. Underneath paste, I'm going to click on that triangle. Make sure you click on the triangle. All right, go back to Excel, open that file up, select it, and then copy it. And then it should appear up in your clipboard. When you guys are at that paste, you click on the triangle. You should have this command right here. It says paste special. Click on that. Because by default, when you paste something, it's going to paste as an embedded object. Here we're trying to do links. Is this still grade or is it? Do you guys have that option where you can put a dot next to paste link or is it grade? Interesting. We closed out of it, right? We copied it, but now it's grayed out. So does the file need to be open when we make the link? Let's find out. Let's close out of this. Let's clear our clipboard. So hit clear all. Go back down here to the folder. Go to integration part B. Double click on the file called your name followed by the inventory. Select from A3 down to B22 and copy it. Adam, when you did copy this, did your paste go active? Go back to Word, but this time leave Excel open. Go to a little triangle underneath paste. Click on the paste special. Now is your paste link active. Now the reason why I did that, folks, is last year, when, or sorry, last semester my students were taking this final, they would come to me like that paste link is grayed out. And I'm like, I can't tell you anything more. Play around. And they're spending hours on this being locked out. Now you notice the paste was just fine, the first one. Because you can embed it, but you can not establish a link to a file that's not already open. Does that make sense? So when you copy and you want to make a link, keep your file open. So now put a dot next to paste link. When you do that, you'll see you have a list of options over here, change. Yes. You said you click on this triangle. Under this one underneath paste. Right. Click paste special. Oh, yeah. Oh, but we need to go back and open up to hit cancel. Clear all. For a second, go down to so copy that. Go to Word. Go to that paste. Choose paste special. Put a dot next to paste. Paste special. Sorry, paste link. Sorry about that. There you go. Okay, what type of object was this? It's a worksheet. So click on Microsoft Excel worksheet object and click OK. Save this, so hold the control key, hit the letter S. 
Let's go back to Excel and close out of that file now. So I'm going to close out of it. Back in Word. Now it seems like if this is the only thing I want to do, and I want to make a change to this price list, if I embedded this, what I would have to do is go to the original file, open it up, and make the change. But I establish a link here between Word and Excel. And what I would like to do is be able to make this change right here. So let's double click on that table. When you double click on that table, did it bring Excel up for you? You notice we closed out of it. I double clicked on that little worksheet in Word. And when I did that, it brought it up. All right, let's see. Men's basic, uh, sorry, men's basic pants. Change that 469. Let's make it, uh, what do they want? 349.99. So, when you get done making that change to the man's basic pants, come down here to uh, the woman's basic jacket and change the 479.49. Uh, let's make that 429.99. Hold the control key, hit the letter S to save those changes. Close out of the Excel sheet. Go back to Word. Did the man's uh, basic jacket change yet? Did the woman's basic pants change, or vice versa? I think we did the woman's jacket and the man's pants. Did they change? No, they're still in the 400 range. Right click anywhere on that worksheet, make sure you're in Word, and click Update Link. Now did they change? By the way, I want to let you know I was using 2013 in my office. And when I did this exercise, the moment I made that change in Excel, it happened right in Word without me up updating it. When's another time that a file will update itself? What did we learn on Tuesday with the file names? When you open up that file again, so if you close out of it and you open it up, let's try that. Let's save this file. Let's close out of it. Let's go back to our integration part B folder and let's double click on the file with your name called memo. Did you guys get this to come up now? And the reason why this is coming up is because you have a link between two files and they're asking you, do you want to update the information on this document? Go ahead, click yes. So, you show, so I showed you guys basically how to establish a link, and this could work on many different objects. The key here is you just don't click on paste anymore. You click under the triangle under paste, and you choose paste special. Then you're greeted with a dialog box that tells you what? Paste or paste as link. You want the link if you want to try to keep two files connected together that rely on each other for information. All right, any questions? So we're done with the Excel part, now let's go into Access. Let's go back down here to your little folder, click on Integration Part B, make sure you're in the folder not the compressed file. Open up the All Associates Access file. Enable the content. If you are singing along, I believe we are on number seven, step number seven. Go up to File, choose Save Database As. Now I'm in my Documents folder, I'm happy with that, I'm just going to leave it there. Remember, when you're saving files, pay attention to where you're saving it to. I'm going to replace the I01B with my last name followed by my first. And now let me click Save. I'm going to click the Enable Content button again. What are the four objects of a database? Kiana, give me one of the, uh, one of the four objects. Table. 
Brittany, give me another object. Forms. All right, Adam, give me a, a third object. Queries. Queries, which you don't see up there. Kudos for you. Dan, reports. All right, so not only do you need to know the objects in a database, but you also need to know what they serve as a purpose. What do tables do? Jessica, what do tables do? What are the purpose of a table? Yeah, to store a data on a single topic, right? So when we open up the sales associate table, what do I expect to see there? Information pertaining to our employees. So we gave them an ID. Carl, what's another name for an ID field? Usually has a little golden key icon. Is it up there? Nope, not up there yet. Well, tell me what's the purpose of an ID field? To identify, so it's a unique identifier, so that no two employees can have the same employee number. So we call it a primary key. Okay? And the primary keys are going to be used by other tables to make relationships. We good about that, folks? All right, let's close out of this table. Let's open up the store locations. You see over here, I now have these plus, and the sales associate, sorry, associates table, I didn't have it, but in the store's location, locations, I do. Click on one of the plus next to, uh, let's do OR40. What does this tell you when you click on that plus? What are they trying to tell you, I should say? These are all the sales associated to this particular store. See that? So basically, these are the employees that work here. There's a relationship. Employees work at stores. That's where the primary key comes in. I match this with their employee number. Okay? Let's close out of that for a second. So just hit the plus, hit the minus key, and now it's back to a consolidated list. What other, what other object in a database would allow us to do the same thing? Like, what if I just want to show only employees that work in the state of Oregon? What object would I do that? Notice I gave you a question. So Mitch, I gave you a question. I want a list of only employees from Oregon. Questions begin with a Q. What other object begins with a Q? Query. Let's do that. How do I create a brand new query? Go to the Create tab. We're going to create our query in Design. So click on Query Design. Now you notice I want a list of employees that work for or work in the state of Oregon. So I'm going to need both of these tables, right? Because the names of my employees are stored in this table, but the states are stored in this table, correct? So double click on both of those. It should add it to the upper pane right here. After you add both of those tables to this preview pane, close that show or add tables. Notice you have that little one-to-many relationship. We good with that? Add the employee's first name followed by their last name. So double click on each of those fields. When you double click on those fields, it should add it down here below. And then double click on state. Now I have a question for you. Was it spelled out in the state field or was it abbreviated? Was Oregon just O-R or was it O-R-E-G-O-N? What do they say about making assumptions, right guys? So let's go over here back to the store locations table. So please click on that. We already had it open, right? And now we can safely say that it is OR, right? Go back to that query one tab. Why is that important? Because now I'm going to narrow down or filter my results. 
underneath the state column, I have a row called criteria. So make sure you click on that cell on the criteria row and just type in capital O, capital R, and then hit run. So in the upper left corner, click the exclamation point. And you see how they're giving you a list of all the employees from Oregon? Pretty good. Go back to uh, design view. What if I wanted it only from a particular store? What if I'm sending a memo to just a new branch? In this case, what if I'm sending it to the OR40 store? Where would I type in OR-40? Because after all, if I look at the store location, or it's not even a dash, it's just OR-40. What field contained the OR-40 information? Store ID. store ID, not the state, right? So let's go back to that query. How do I change this so that I replace this field with the ID? See what happens when you guys click on state. You get a little arrow pointing down. Click on that. And what am I going to click on now, Josh? Store ID. Very good. Now I'm going to come down here and replace OR. Re remove everything. Just type it all over again. Capital O, capital R, 40. And now I'm going to hit run. You see how it gave me a little bit smaller subset versus the other one? So I have more stores in Oregon, but now I just want to focus on one particular store in Oregon. Did I really need to build my primary key, my store ID, with the state plus the number? Could I have added the state field and then just made the ID like a number? This just makes it real easy for us to filter, right? Because if I was doing a store in New York, what should the ID begin with? NY followed by a number. All right, let's save this query. So let's click on the floppy disk. By the way, when's the only time do we save in a database? Bless you. You notice we're making changes to the, the tables and the queries. They didn't ask me to save. But I added a new query, right? I didn't add the data. I just added a new object. So anytime you make a structural change to a database, that is, you change the object or delete or add a new object, you need to save that. Why don't you have to save it when you make a change to the data? What is the heart of a database? In fact, it has the first four letters of it. Data, right? <coughs> so you don't want your employees to make a blunder and forget to save after entering in a million records. Because remember, the reason why we use databases is so that other programs or other people can make informed decisions off the data. If you pay somebody even $10 an hour to enter in a million records, your company's going to lose billions of dollars because they're counting on those records to be there so that when they run an inventory check, they don't order the wrong things, correct? So the data, when it changes, automatically is saved. But when you change the database objects, like add a query, you need to save those. So let's call this one what? Store 40? Let's click OK. Let's close out of this query. Let's close out of store locations. So we talked about tables and how they're designed to hold the data or organize them. We talked about queries, how that gives us a view of a limited record set, correct? By adding a criteria. So what do forms do? Could you guys give me an example of a form that you guys use every day? So when you go to a web page and you have to authenticate? Josh? Hey, it allows us to enter or modify data. Let's open up the sales associate form.
Let's add a new record. How would I do that using this form? Down here near the navigation area, you see I have some triangles pointing left or right so I can navigate between each record. Which one of those buttons would allow me to create a brand new record? Yeah, the one with the uh, little star next to it. Let's click on that. Do you notice in forms I'm only seeing it one record at a time? Instead of having all the records and then the fields listed across, I see the fields right here and then each of those containers listed for me. Uh, let's type in the ID. What do they want us to put in there for your ID number? Uh, if you're singing along, it's page 9, 10-60539. And how can I move from field to field without lifting my hand off the keyboard? Tab key. So go ahead, type in your name. Uh, what do they want you to put in there? Sales manager. And then the store ID that you guys are going for is NB88. So you're the 88 store in New Mexico. Where is this being stored at right now? Hard drive? And what table? It's always hard to tell because sometimes your form could have multiple tables on there and it just gives you a nice easy way to enter in data. Like for instance, the store ID might be stored in the store location, correct? Let's close out of this form and let's open up the sales associate table. See if you can find your name. Should be in there, right? How is this table sorted? Probably by ID number, as I'm looking down through here. What's the quickest way to find that while you're within this table? You notice each of these fields have little triangles next to them. You guys knew that you worked for store NB88, right? So instead of going out there and creating a query to find this, if you clicked on the triangle next to store ID, remove the check next to select all, and then place the check next to NB88 and click OK. Nice smaller list. Did you delete all those other records in this table? No, all you do is turn them off. You can see down here in the status bar, it says filtered. And now you might see that you're the last one, depending on how it's sort, sorted. How do I remove that filter? There's a little thing up here that says toggle filter. Go ahead, click on that. All right, let's close out of this table. It's going to ask you to save. Why? We, we didn't add anything. We didn't even add the record. Remember, we used the form to add the record here. We added a filter, removed the filter, so that changed the structure a little bit. So click yes. It wouldn't actually make a huge difference in this case, but if somebody else was to open up that table and you wanted that filter to be left on, then that's where you would save it as. All right. So that's some um, access and review to get you guys some brushed up with it. Let's open up store location. Now let's export this so it's in a word-friendly format, correct? Word works with tables, but not anything like what access does. And that is access relates tables with other tables. Word just displays tables in a column row format. So how can I export this data? How do we do this Tuesday? from access to Excel. We went to external data, very good. It doesn't do it nearly as friendly as it did it with Excel, right? Because in Excel you had this little button that said export to Excel. Here we have to go over here to more. And we're going to choose the first one, export it as a word object. And what that's going to do is make it a rich text format. Do me a favor, verify the location. It should say documents. Is that what it says for you folks? 
If it doesn't, it says some other folder. Make sure you know what folder it is so you can find this file. Between that backslash and store location, Jessica. We're not going to be using this just yet. This is not for the mail merge. Okay, yes, that would do a mail merge like you're talking about, but we're not going to be using this for the mail merge. All right, uh, we would be using the associates table. This is just a list of our stores. Okay, a very nice forethought. She's asking, basically, she sees this command called word merge, and that'd be for mail merging, right from access directly into Word. Okay, but we're not doing that. What I want to do is just create this table and paste it into the memo saying these are our stores. All right, so change the name of it so it's your last name. So between the backslash and store, put your last name, underscore, your first name, underscore, and then it reads store location. And the reason why I'm doing that is just in case you've done this exercise over again or when you downloaded it, there's already a file called storelocation.rtf. When you guys get done giving it the proper name, just click OK. Hit close. Go back to your word memo. Hold the control key and hit the END key. It's right above the up arrow. Nice little shortcut key that throws you right down to the bottom of the document. Is that what it did for everybody? All right. Anybody can remember from the very first lab back in January, February, where they asked you to insert a text object into Word. Remember how to do that? Go to insert, and nah, quick parts is in footers. Object, so click on that triangle next to object. And what are you going to click now? Text from file. How's that different than copy and pasting? What's to stop me from opening up that Andre Nicholas store location and copying that table and pasting it? Why did your lab assignment have you do that? Because some of you tried copy and pasting and you lost a couple of points. Because some of those files contain those document properties like a bibliography and they had work cited stuff that was in the footer that you couldn't copy over. When you insert this way, you bring everything. All the document properties with you, all the bibliographies, work cited. So let's open that up by double clicking on it. You know what? They don't care about the store ID. Tell me, true or false, to delete a column in a word table, all you have to do is highlight it and hit the delete key on your keyboard. Try that. Highlight this first column and hit the delete key on your keyboard. Does it delete the column? No. What does it do? Deletes the contents, right? So how do I delete a column? Right click anywhere on the column that you want to delete, and then choose delete columns. Okay guys, you see this address stuff is looking pretty good until I get to Water Street? How can I have the table automatically fit to its contents? Right click anywhere on the table. Sure, let's try that. And then you're telling me to choose auto fit and then what would you pick for your option? I like it. So go ahead and try that guys. Then it fix everything for you so that now the columns are in proper width. Because if you're under the design tab, there might be an alignment thing, but what that's going to do is change the content alignment. What I want to do is change the table alignment. So I'm going to go to the upper left corner of the table Click once on a little crosshair thing so the whole table is highlighted. And then I'm going to go up to the Home tab and click on the center button above Paragraph. And did that throw the table in the center of the page now? All right. Change the style to this table. How would I go about changing the style of the table so it's colorful? Yeah. 
Yeah, under Table Tools, click the Design tab. Very good. And what am I going to pick next? Any one of the beautiful styles. So if I click on the More button, pointing down, uh, I like blue, so I'm just going to pick this alternating blue series. So let me scroll down. And I'll just pick this one right here. When I did that, did that throw me back to the left margin? So what is styles? It's just a bunch of pre-designated stuff, including alignment, font size, uh, orientation, as you just saw. So you might have to recenter that. In an intermediary course for Word, you guys will learn how to create your own styles. So if you have a particular format that you use for images or for certain paragraphs or for headings, you can go up there and make a pre-designed set. Font attributes, font name, size, alignment, and so on. Paragraph spacing. And you can save it as your own default, and you can set it up in one of those style boxes for you, so you can quickly go to it. That's all they are, is just a quick one-stop, one-shop to get everything done. All right. Last thing. So he brought a file in. By the way, is this file embedded or linked? To it. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to do it right from Word. Now, as Jessica pointed out, you could do it from Access. Folks, links flow both ways. So whether you're in one program and you want to do it to the other, you can, or vice versa. I'm already in Word. Let's stay in Word. Hold the Control key and hit the Home button. It should take you right up top where it says Front Range uh, Action Sports, right? Click on the line that says Memo 2. You notice it's empty. Have you ever received those junk mails that said, hey, you're a millionaire and has your name on it and a fake check? Should you feel special? Why not? Because everybody receives those, right? Even though it says, hey, Nick Andre, you won a million dollars. My neighbor received it and it won't say, hey, Nick Andre, you won a million dollars. It's going to say, hey, so and so, you won a million dollars, right? So everybody's a millionaire. How did they do that? Did they hire some dropout college kid to enter in each of those blank checks, a person's name? No. They paid a corporation to access their database. What do they care about? Person's name, address, state, city, and zip, right? We're going to do the same thing. We're going to create a mail merge that's going to mail it to a select group. That is that store 40 from Oregon. So we're not going to print out all 61 records. We're only going to do about four or so. So we clicked in here. We're going to go up top in the tab called Mailings. Now, folks, you can do this using the wizard, or you can do it customly. I don't care which way you do it. I'm going to do it through the select recipients, because I'm not really writing a letter, a letter that has address information. I'm doing a memo. So then click on the triangle next to select recipients. What option would you guys choose from here? Do you want to type all those people out over again? No, you're going to use the existing one. So go ahead and click on that option. Hmm. Where's that at? Where'd you guys save your database to? I saved mine in the download folder in the folder called Integration Part B. You might have saved yours somewhere else. Right? In fact, I believe I actually changed the location of documents. Did you guys change your location of documents? I know this is the newest one because guess what? I look at the time that it was last modified. It was about 10 minutes ago. But more importantly, I also noticed that I put my name on there. Folks, do that. On your final exam, you're going to be managing a lot of files. There's nothing wrong with changing the file name. So that you know, hey, I know it's that one because we did change the name. Because if I went to the other one, that query is not going to be in there, correct? Because we made that query. So let's open up the Andre Nicholas, also, well, whatever your database name is. Click open. Do you notice the mail merge only works with two data types? Tables and what they call a view, which we call a Query. Let's click on the store 40 and let's click OK. 
Interesting. When I did that, these buttons over here came to life. Do you see how those little arrows like I did in the form? But the Word document's confused. It doesn't know what they really need to work with. So how do I tell it what fields in that query should be brought into this memo? Did I see up above you have insert merge fields? Click under that triangle. Do you see the list of fields that you have available? Where did they get those fields from? That query called store 40. We only had three of those fields. Let's, go, oh, let's click on first name one time. Put a space after that. And let's click on that triangle again and click on last name. Pretty goofy, it's keeping it generic. It just says first name, last name. Notice I put a space between first and last so that when I print it out, it's going to look proper. What button might you click on so you can get a preview of the results so it actually reads out a person's name? Let's try that. I'm making this so that you guys remember so clearly that, hey, I guess they used the right GUI names that you need to know. When you click on that, do you see now it replaced the first name, last name with the actual first name, last name? Let's page through these. So up here, you have these triangles. Just click on one of them. Did it change the name? Still working fine? All right, folks. Now we have the person's first name and last name. Let's make a little bit special and let's add a greeting line. Between subject and I am pleased to welcome, you might have to go to where I am pleased and then hit the enter key so you get a blank line between subject and that paragraph. Up here, do you guys have the uh, greeting line? Go ahead and click on that. What I would like it to say is, Dear Mr. or Dear Mrs., then their last name. Did you notice our tables did not contain a Mr. or Mrs.? So it lacked the courtesy title. But we're still going to put this in here. So we have a dear, then it says first name, last name, followed by the suffix, right? Click under that triangle pointing down. And choose the Mr. Randall, Dale. Click on that. Notice where the preview says it doesn't add the Mr. It's still first name. Click OK. Can anybody tell me why that's not showing me the Mr. or Mrs. that I want it to show? It still just reads first name followed by last name. And let me zoom in so you guys can see it. But I, I told it to, hey, what I want is a Mr. or Mrs. followed by their last name. It doesn't have that information. Let's go back to our database. So go back to Access. Close out of the store location table. Open up the sales associates table. What do I have to work with? All I have is the first name, last name. I have their title, which is cool, but it's not their courtesy title. They're Mr. or Mrs. or Doctor. How can I add a new field to this table? Click Add. Where's Add at? Oh, right here? Sure, we can add it there. Sorry, I wasn't paying attention to that. So let's click there. What are we going to make this? Text sounds great. Make it a text. What are we going to call it? Courtesy title? Because title is already used. Oh, isn't that a shame? Did you guys get this? Why can't I modify the table structure? Oh, yours didn't come up with it? Ooh. Did your mail merger work? Did, did it not or did it? Your mail merge? Let me check that out. If it did not come up with that, then... You might have been closed out of Word. Let's go back to Word for a second. And your mail merge did work. That's fascinating. Because I can see the person's name and know what it should have said is not allowed to because you're currently involved in this. But it doesn't, so we'll play along. <laughs> Everybody click OK.
What do you think you would do to avoid this? Exactly. So let's go down to Word, save it. So hold the control key, hit the letter S, close out of the Word file. Now see if you can add that field. Text, and Tina, we're back to where you're at. So just type in courtesy, ta uh, courtesy title and hit enter. By the way, folks, I'm not going to have you update all 61 records, okay? Do you see why it's important for a database administrator to talk to you to your blue in the faith to let them know what your company feels is important to keep track of? We thought it'd be really nice to be able to send it to Dr. or Mr. or Mrs. so-and-so. But when we designed our table, we excluded that critical piece of information. Now we have 61 employees in here, and guess what you think we would have to do if this is a real company's database? Update every single one of them. Folks, this could be hundreds of thousands. Because it's not only present, but it's also past records that you'd have to update. Well, what are we going to do to make life simple for us? We're going to make a little filter for the, uh, for the store ID. So let's click on that. And we're going to remove where it says select all, and we're going to do OR40, right? So we're going to come down here and click OR40. Click OK. And now, what I'm going to do is move the courtesy title so it's between ID and first name, so I know if they're a Mr. or Mrs. So I click and hold on courtesy title, drag it to the left, and drop it between ID and first name. And then the first one, let's make her a miss. We make Jerry, so with the down arrow, a mister. Fernando, we'll make it a doctor. Make the next person a doctor. We'll make Judy a missus. And we'll make Austin a mister. Now I only decided to filter the list so this way my mail merger would work with the mister and missus. Naturally, you guys would go back and enter all the 60 or 61 records. Do I need to say this or not? Jessica, you're shaking your head yes. Why do we need to save this? I added a field. Yep, so let's click Save. Let's close out of this table. Is my mail merge going to get this new update? I'll give you a hint. It begins with the letter N, ends with the letter O. Why will our mail merger not get this update? What did we build our mail merger off of? What's that? A query. We build it off the query. And what fields did we choose in our query? First name, last name, store ID, right? Did it say anything about a courtesy title? So what do you think I'm going to do? I'm going to come over here. I'm going to right-click on store 40 or whatever your query is. So I'm right-clicking on that, and I'm going to choose design view. Folks, we know that the only people are going to be the store 40. Do I need to show that? No. So let's remove this check next to store ID show. I'm, I'm only using it to filter. I don't need to see it. The next thing I'm going to do is come back over here to Sales Associate. I'm going to double click on Courtesy Title. By double clicking, it throws the field in here. Should I care about order? My mail merger doesn't care. All it needs me to do is match the query for fields with the mail merge fields. That's it. So let's save this. And why am I saving it again? Because I made a structural change, right? I said, show this, don't show that. Let's close out of this query. Let's go back to our memo. So open up our memo. Hmm, interesting. Did you guys get this now? Because now it's a mail merge, so we're going to click yes. And you're going to get another one. What's this one about? The little Excel worksheet, the link there. Click yes. 
Does it still read dear, first name, last name? Yeah. Mm. Did all that work and I still didn't get anywhere. Let's go back up to mailings. You guys have this field called man or match fields? Sorry, this little command called matching fields. So go ahead, let's click on match fields. Do you see courtesy title? Because I misspelled it. Isn't being matched automatically. So let's go over here where it says not matched next to courtesy title. And clicked on it once. I actually spelled it right, but I think what oh, there was no space between the courtesy and title. So it couldn't auto guess this. We good with that? So were you guys able to select that now? Click OK. No go yet, right? Go back here to where it says dear. Remove the preview results. And it just says greeting line, correct? Good. Come back up to greeting line. Now does it have it in the preview? Dear then misses. Click OK. By the way, you might have to let me try that again. Delete the original greeting. Turn preview back on. So did you see I had two greeting lines, I had to delete them and then redo it. Sorry about that. I know. Class is going by all, going awfully slow, isn't it? Good thing is we only have one more thing to do. So how do we delete the old? Just click on that line, hit the delete key, and it should delete it. Oh, okay. It might delete everything on that line. I lie, we got two things to do and that's it. Anybody have any suggestions how I can get that one chart back up here so it's on one page? Okay, how do I reduce the space between dear and I am? Of paragraph? Very good. What are you going to do next? On the after, very good. It's first I never had that answer right on the first try. So what she's saying is that your paragraph mark, your paragraphs can have spaces before and after it. And this is telling you how much white space you want before the paragraph and how much you want after it. 18 is a little too much. Let's make it one. I'll make it 12. Let's make it a 12. Let's click OK. And what that did was it just made this space in between these two things smaller. Let's do the same thing with subject. So click anywhere on the subject line, go back to the home tab, in the paragraph group, click on launch, the launch button, change the 18 to 12, and click OK. When you do that, it should throw this back up to there. What's another way of doing that without having to mess around with paragraph numbers, or paragraph spacing? Could make the font smaller, but then it might be harder to read. You guys do this, especially when your uh, English instructor tells you it needs to be one page. Crank up the what? I'll cover the microphone. You could crank up the font size, but I said there might be... Okay, you could do the period size. That's clever. Oh, that's so subtle. Well, there's a lot of periods. And you could hold the control F and do a search on all periods. And then, yeah, that's, that's, I gotta make the new note for myself. <laughs> what else could we do? Good double space or change the whole spacing and, you know, what else could we do? Margins, I was waiting for that one. Yeah, tweak the left, right, top, bottom. All right, let's just say we don't do that. I'm happy that's two pages, but you guys get the idea of you know how to do that. Last thing I want to make sure that you guys know how to do is you guys can insert a picture if you wanted to. Then let's just print this one thing out. Go back to mailings, and I want to print the current record I am on. The way I'm going to do that is I'm going to click Finish and Merge. Bless you. When I do have that, I have a bunch of choices. I'm going to click Print Document. Please, on your exam, do not put a dot next to all. 
Put it right here, current record. Click OK. And it's going to ask you what printer do you want to send it to. Change the printer to the appropriate printer. Oh, they're gone. Do you guys have any printers listed? It should be the HP LaserJet. Uh, 3015? Is that what you guys have? 3015? Yep, choose that one then. Sorry. I'll have to find my printer. There it is. And with all go well, it should just print out two pages per each person. Kiana, question? Just stretching. Okay. Yes, please do. I wonder why. <laughs> All right, any questions you guys might have? Remember, uh, next week is review week. Uh, we'll be doing both theory and office review. As far as I'm concerned.